Remember Michelangelo, the great sculptor? He, he, ta- he writes about how he would go to marble quarry and study pieces of marble and find one, oh, this one will make a good, you know. But God goes to the human quarry and he takes the rejected pieces of marble mm. that nobody would use. And he says, I can make something beautiful of this. Mm. What a great artist he is. He doesn't just need the perfect piece of marble. He takes our ashes and forms them into something beautiful. Welcome back to Advent Next, a theological podcast curated for curious faith discussions. This week, we're continuing our talk with Dr. Joanne Davidson, Professor of Systematic Theology at Andrews University. Today, our topic is taken from her book, Towards a Theology of Beauty, where we explore the aesthetic nature of God and how he uses beauty, creativity, and artistry to express his character and values. Today, we're exploring why the artist isn't listed as the expression of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 11 along with whether or not it's even economically viable to be a full-time artist in the church. If you'd like to listen to some of our other podcasts related to faith and theology, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, or Apple Podcast at Advent Next, or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at the handle at Advent Next. My co-host today is Brittany Husset. You can find her at the handle at Britt.Husset. As always, I'm your host, Kendra Arsenal, and this is Advent Next. So you mentioned that artistic talent is a gift from God, like we were talking about, and can be a sacred vocation, with Bezalel being an example of that. Yes. Um, so um, given that and the experience kind of I was telling you about that I think is probably not terribly uncommon um, in church contexts, should in European Christians pursue artistic vocations? Do you have any insight um, perhaps into why creativity and artistic gifting seems to have been left out of passages such as Ephesians 4.11 that gives that list of pastors and teachers. And yeah, and, and that's a good question. What we got, first of all, I, uh, there, you've asked several questions. First of all, I think the Christians have been remiss not to include artistic gifts as, as uh, appreciated being with God. I remember when I went into music, I thought, well, you know, you're going to compose this or we have assignments to compose or analyze st- a structure because every symphony and every concerto and every piece of music has a structure hmm. and it's and it's carefully plotted and put together. And I remember in class uh, in, in music theory, people would say, do you mean that Bach actually put a structure, planned a structure and put, put all the pieces in and doctor? The p- professor said, no, I think it's the nature of inspiration. The, and... Not everybody can compose like Bach, but he was gifted like Bezalel was. Not everyone can write a symphony, but th- 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 those composers were. And they said, yeah, but they had such terrible lives. And I said, well, if God had to wait for the perfect life before he gave his gifts, there would never have been any gifts. God works with sinners. Mm-hmm. He works with sinners and hopes that they will, through this, find him. But we usually fail him, but God doesn't wait. But he gives gifts. And I think a really good architect is it's a gift that they develop. And so our classes are to, d- to help us find what gifts God has given us. We've all given gifts. No one person has all the gifts. Mm-hmm. No one does. Furthermore, no one Bible text teaches everything. No one Bible text. That's why the Bible is a system of truth, and you have to put it all together with this example of what God does. Now, why is it not in Ephesians? Paul is a what is called a contextual theologian. Mm-hmm. He's writing to context. He's not writing a theology book. He writes something to the Philippian church. He writes something to the Galatian church. He writes something to the two letters to the Corinthian church. And he's writing to context there. These are churches that he established. And that doesn't make the letters any less inspiring. They're inspired, but he's not dealing with theology. He's putting a piece of the puzzle of this situation that you find yourself in there in Corinth or Ephesus or this is what I want you to know. And people that read the book of Ephesians say this is God, his great doxology for who God is and what God is able to do through sinners and through the church. And so he's he's talking to a context there. And so you can't pull that out and say, well, he didn't deal with that. Well, he doesn't deal with a lot of things. But in the Philippian church, he does. He says, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, think on these things. He deals with aesthetics there. But he, in the context of Ephesus, that wasn't what he was dealing with. He was dealing with the situation that they were, see, so established these churches, and ex, the book of Acts says he'd stay two or three years in a place and teach hours a day. Then he'd go on to another city, and then he'd hear about the problems they were having, and he'd write them a letter. And I've heard this about you, and he'd deal with a context that they were struggling with or succeeding at and send them letters. And I'll put them all together, 
you learn what Paul's thinking theologically, but no one letter deals with everything that he was dealing with in other churches. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a very helpful letter. And but what's his intent? What's his intent? And he he, he doesn't talk about the Sabbath to the Ephesians either. Mm-hmm. Well, that wasn't must not have been a problem there. And so he, he's he's writing to what can help them in the situation they're in now. And it's an inspired letter, mm-hmm. but it doesn't teach you everything that he thinks. Wow. Mm. Wow. So when we're looking at, at Christ and God as an artist, you know, what are some of the implications to us as individuals and to the church? And you talk a little bit about this at the end of your book, and I thought maybe you could share some of that with us today. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's, so, there's so much that could be said about that, too. I think that Seventh-day Adventists, and not, not all Christians, but Seventh-day Adventists have been slow to appreciate the aesthetic value. Mm-hmm. I've been in, uh, lived several places, and I've visited other churches, and things come up about, um, well, we should really replace the carpet. Well, no, we need to give that money to the poor, or we should do this. Not realizing that what we, how we, how God's house looks, preaches during the week. I went to an architecture lecture here on campus. They have this great architecture department here, and they invite architects to come from and give lectures during the year mm. sometimes. And I remember went went to one, and this church architect, and he said, you know. You use your building once a week, maybe twice a week, but the rest of the week, it's preaching to the community Mm. what you think about God. And so he said, I think that's why churches should have high ceilings. Mm. He says, otherwise you come in, our homes are made so that they match proportionally our height and size. And so everything fits our proportion. But when you go to church, you should feel small in 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 the presence of the great God. Mm-hmm. And he so says, that's why you should have a high ceiling. And that preaches something. And he said, how you landscape and how you, the colors you use can preach how, how wonderful God is mm. and how he's interested in beauty and design. And, and you can reflect this in your uh, statement of God uh, as you, how you des- decorate your church. And so when you do this, you're not taking away money from the poor. Because it's interesting, God tells them in Exodus, I want you to build me this elaborate sanctuary, da 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 da, and I want you to take care of the poor. Mm-hmm. It's not either or, it's both and. Yeah. It's both and. And we, we, we pull them apart and say, well, we shouldn't waste the money here. It's as if it's a waste. He says, no, you, you take care of the poor. This is something else you do to represent me fairly in the world. Wow. Mm-hmm. It reminds me one time I was invited to speak down in Texas, and the pastor picked me up took me to his church, and we got there just in time for the Friday evening meeting. We drove up. It was a small building, but but it had stained glass windows with lights from the inside. I said, oh, those are so beautiful. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, I'll have to tell you about them. So when he was taken to my room afterwards, he, he said, a few years ago, a stained glass, a stained glass artist moved into town. He wanted to live in a warm climate. And uh, he came into church, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm retired now. I can't afford to do to buy the glass but if you would buy the glass i'd be glad to put in stained glass windows for you wow free and so he took it to the pastor i took to the church board and they said oh no we've got to give that money to the poor Mm. and so he told the he told the artist he said oh okay he said well i have enough money to do one window i said oh uh, you have a window over your baptistry and i i have enough money i could make a beautiful scene with a waterfall coming into the baptistry and i I could pour that one Mm. and the pastor said do it so he, he said, I knew he had to do it in one week. And so he planned the design and cut all the pieces and got all the equipment. And as soon as the sun went down one Sabbath, he moved into the church. And because he knew if he was halfway done on Sabbath, it wouldn't have the effect. But he all week long, he worked night and day, slept at the church, and he got this beautiful, the window was already in place, but it was just wow. a glass window. And then he said, I stood Sabbath morning in the foyer to watch people's reaction because the sun was coming in. It was placed just right. Wow. And people came in and they walked into the church and went, oh. and then, you know, oh, because it was just so beautiful. And he said, one of the people who came to the pastor after, afterwards, he says, you know, that really is a beautiful one. I could, I'd be glad to pay for one of the stained glass windows. In the sun. Mm. And so slowly but surely they got all these precious windows with a beautiful scene, bi- biblical scenes. And then the pastor said, you know, with these beautiful windows, our church really looks dilapidated. We should get some clean carpet. And he said our, our, our parking lot is muddy. I mean, it hasn't been 
uh, paved, and so we bring mud in. And he said, we should pave that and get some new carpet and make this church look beautiful. Oh, the church board said, oh, no, we got to give that money to the poor. And the pastor said, yes, we got to give money to the poor, but we're going to make God's house beautiful. Mm. So slowly but surely, they got it all done. And then he said, now we're going to put a sign out front. Oh, we got to give the money to the poor. He said, yes, we will give money to the poor. We need to do that. But we need to, Ellen White says that our name, Seventh-day Adventist, has convicting power. We need to have our name out front. So they finally got a sign. This took one over a couple of years. And then the clincher of the story was when they first put the uh, uh, lights from the inside so the window showed at night and the light on the sign so the sign showed at night. The next day, uh, someone across the road, the street from the church, called the pastor and said, you know, your new church is just beautiful. Wow. That church had been there for years. Mm. Years. And but, nobody noticed it. But nobody noticed it. But when it became beautiful. Oh, and I forgot. The man, the, the stained glass artist said, we need to put some beautiful landscaping around the building to attract the butterflies and the birds. Wow. So they put some flowering bushes. And, you know, see, beauty has a, a, a convicting power. Mm-hmm. It has a convicting power. But we've, we've forgotten that. Wow. But God, God knows. And he, he knows how it will be a blessing to us and helping us understand him, too. It makes me think of the story of Mary of Magdalene. Oh, yes. You know, and, and her pouring out the ointment, the, the years Expensive worth, ointment. Very expensive. Years wages worth. Yeah. And the argument between the disciples, well, this, why, why what waste? Yeah, waste. <laughs> you know, we should have given this money to the poor. And, and Jesus is like, don't bother her. Like, what she's done is a beautiful thing beautiful to me. Thing. Beautiful thing. And for us to have that kind of devotion and worship, to, to be lavish in our gifts, uh, on Christ. I think that he appreciates that and he sh- he's demonstrated that in that interaction. Yeah. Well, it reminds me too, I visited another church and the, they had this beautiful grand piano in the sanctuary and and it, I like to play grand pianos. The sound is so nice. And so I was playing it afterwards waiting for potluck and the pastor told me, somebody told him, one of the members, you know, we're buying a new piano for our house so we'll give the old one to the church. Mm. And the pastor says, why don't you give the new one to the church? Ooh, yeah. And so they got this beautiful... See, we have this idea, a, a, gift, a shabby gift, and but I'm giving it to the church, so it's... Uh, but instead of, give, yeah. like Mary, giving the very best she could. Yeah. And because, I think Malachi talks about that, right? He says, I don't want your lame offerings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's because it, if our heart is in tune to Jesus and what he's done, the beautiful gift of salvation, we'll want to make a beautiful gift for him. Mm. Yeah. Amen. You make a few references to two kind of disparate reactions, the two aesthetics that both seem to be evident uh, in our society today, both within Christian religious culture and without. Um, There's the dismissal of aesthetics as inferior to pure reason and the opposite view of aesthetics being the subject of worship. I think you've mentioned in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, Given your research and exegesis, where would you say the Bible leads the Christian in relation to these kind of two polar reactions? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I think the answer is different for different people. Mm-hmm. But I think, um, I think the study of evolu- uh, people accepting evolution rather than God being creator has moved people away from the meanings of beauty because um, it, it, if there's no master designer, things just happen by chance. It, it diminishes your idea of what God can do. And other people worship aesthetics, and that's not right either, because aesthetic experience is so rich and so full. As like one writer put it, 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 it it's a, a deep experience without the blood and sweat of sin and repentance. And so people want that rather than going through the grind of, Lord, I'm, I'm really a mess. Please forgive me and help me make my life beautiful. And so there's, it, 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 comes at, com, it can happen many different ways, but the study of aesthetics is not the study of religion. Hmm. It's not a religion. It is a it's a way of understanding who God is, and it's the principles involved in what an aspect of God. And he says, Joanne, I not only gave you a mind, which I want people to have. I not only gave you heart, but I gave you senses to appreciate the world that I've made and what I want to do. So I treasure the whole, your whole being, not just your... See, even Sabbath can become a mental thing and not a, a, not a, not a involving our whole soul. We, we worship God and bring him, bring him praise the best way we can. At that too, but aesthetics is not a religion, and some to some people it is. To some people it is. Mm. So it, it it try to keep it in balance is not always easy. It's fall off the track one way or another. But mm. we mustn't neglect God's great interest in beauty. I like what the psalmist says. He wanted to go into the sanctuary where he could behold the beauty of the Lord. Mm. 
Mm. And another place he writes talks about God putting in us the beauty of holiness. Everything about what God does is, is beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Even what he wants to do in us is mm. beautiful. I think there's such a, a message of hope in that too. You know, the the, the verse that says he makes takes beauty, bring, brings beauty from ashes. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? yeah. And that he can take our lives and our mess and things that we see as wholly unbeautiful or tragic or the sufferings that we go through. And he has a mind to say, I know how to make this beautiful. And I think that's such a, a hope that we can have about who God is. Amen. Yeah. And that reminds me, remember Michelangelo, the great sculptor who would, and he he, ta- he writes about how he would go to marble core and study pieces of marble and find one, oh, this one will make a good, you know. But God goes to the human quarry and he takes the rejected pieces of marble mm. that nobody would use. And he says, I can make something beautiful of this. Mm. What a great artist he is. He doesn't just need the perfect piece of marble. He takes our ashes and forms them into something beautiful. Mm. I really love that. Oh. <laughs> I, I think that's, it just even shows the beauty of his character. Amen. That mm. he's like, you don't have to be perfect. Like, I'm good enough in my skill set to take whatever and make something beautiful yeah. from that. Yeah. And that we have a good God we can trust in. Amen. Amen. And so I am so touched by this topic because when I was, was younger, I was a writer. I was very adamant at it. Uh, I, Wonderful. I spent hours just kind of pouring myself into, uh, like, I write screenplays and different poetry and stories. Oh, don't stop. <laughs> and so, but there was a period of time when I did stop. And I think this was a, you know, it, when I was in college, I, I had a, a period of, like, just kind of exploring the world, falling away from the Lord. And, and when I came back to Christ, I kind of put those gifts aside because I had this notion in my head, and it wasn't necessarily the church, but it was my idea of like what holiness was um, that I put that all aside because I sure sure I, you, people do I can understand that, and I'm in a space now that I'm like no I think God can use this for good. Amen. Um, <laughs> we need more good writers to express who God is. And so I, I'm so very touched by some of the what you're bringing out about this is an expression of God's character, that he gives people with these things and not to neglect it. What would you say to somebody who is just on the fence about their vocation? They feel like they do feel like they're called uh, to do some type of artistic work, but they feel like it's impractical or they feel like they can't. There's not really a space to serve the Lord. I know, especially with uh, musicians in the church, there's not really like, you know, I'm going to get a degree in music, but I'm not going to come out with a, a job because we don't tend to have that same salaried position that we would have for a pastor. What would you say to somebody who's, who's not sure how to use their gifts in the church? That That's a very good question. And it, it's really sad to me that Christians and even Adventists don't pay our musician. Do you know that in the Old Testament temple set up, that musicians were paid from the tithes just like the priests were. Mm-hmm. So music was important. And even Hezekiah, remember when he restored worship, he said, using the instruments made by David and Nathan the prophet under the instructions of God. So we see it's very closely tied. I, I, I do know that sometimes you can still get jobs in Sunday-keeping churches. I wouldn't give up my Sabbath-keeping, but I, I have sometimes worked at Sunday churches where they paid money. In fact, when my husband was in seminary, I... I was a choir director at a Sunday church in one of these small towns, and they paid me beautifully. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, the Seventh-day Adventist church has been slow about appreciating that. But if I say to a person who is gifted by God in some area, give the gift to God and say, Lord, use this. Show me how I can use it to your glory, and God will open doors and maybe unusual doors that you won't even dream of. Then I, I, I don't, don't turn away from the gift that God's given you. How did you navigate that? Because you got your master's in, in music, and then, but you're also now a doctorate in systematic theology. So, how did you navigate that? Was there a time that you weren't sure if you should continue this path? Like, how did that work out for you? That's a good question. I I taught piano lessons for a number of years, and I hated it. Mm. I love music. I love playing the piano. I love listening to music. But I found it very unsatisfactory to teach because kids didn't usually want to take lessons and their mother wanted them to. And so often they would, I mean, I didn't mind teaching, but they'd say, well, we're not going to come this week or we're not going to come this week or, you know. And so that was always a haphazard thing. And I didn't sense the kids were really wanting to do it. And that was my fault. I was, I said, I, I love music and all, but I, I hate this teaching. It's so unrewarding. And so I, I just keep, I'm, I'm one of the organists out at Eau Claire Church. I, I still use my music, and I, I was a choir director for a little church here uh, in another little town for a couple years when Dick was in seminary. I still use music, but 
I found theology was even more, more um, to reading, studying about who God is and what he does was even more rewarding to teach than the way music lessons go today. You know, this, this topic, like you said, it's just, it's, it's so important. And I just love how you are bringing these things together. Like you said, you were doing music, but decided studying theology was, was more uh, rewarding to you. And just the fact that you're bringing these kinds of things together and that we can um, benefit from, from your, your wisdom in this book and everything is just, well, is phenomenal. I'm, I'm a kindred spirit. Use the gifts that God has given you. We need more, more, more creative people putting out the truths of the Bible in a very appealing way. We need more of the, more of you. So I'll, don't be afraid. I, I've got to tell you, I never dreamed I'd be teaching theology. I've got to tell you. Mm. I was, uh, I quit teaching music because I hated it. Because, not because I hated music, but because of the way, the attitude of so many of the students. And so I, I started studying theology, never knew I would teach. I, I did it just to feed my soul because I'd had such boring Bible classes and I didn't have, realize the richness of scripture. And when I saw that, I I just was feeding my soul. And then when I was done, they asked me to teach. I about fell off my chair because I, I wasn't thinking about it. I was just feeding my hungry soul, and I was expecting to go back into teaching music lessons because I, I, I want the next generation to study music. There's more to music than just playing scales. They're, the understanding structures and, and, and what the expression is and these shapes where the, where the climax is that, that helps you understand the form. That, that's really neat, but I never had many students that really took it seriously. That was why I didn't like it. Mm. But then when I was asked to teach, I whoa. And I said, well, I better ask my husband. I don't know. And so he said, no, do it. You do it. If God's calling you, he will, he will gift you. Wow. So. Is there anything that you'd like to, to leave our listeners today who are wanting to maybe learn a little bit more on the theology of beauty or anything that you have on your heart that you'd like to share with our audience? Okay. Um, I, I came into the study of Scripture in the back door, but I, I tell you, no matter what you study in Scripture, you can find something beautiful there. And if God has gifted you in some even unusual way, just say, Lord, I, I sent you've given me this gift. Please show me how I can use it to bring glory to you. Show me how. And God will do that. I really believe that. There's so many aesthetic gifts, and the, the Christian church needs all of them, needs all of them. So before we end the program today, since we're ending a little early, I'm going to do a few artistic, well, not so artistic, readings of a few quotes from her article that I found particularly interesting. You can find Dr. Joanne Davidson's article on the digital comments at Andrews University entitled, Toward a Theology of Beauty. Some of these quotes are also included in the full rendition of her book. Aesthetic expression is an all-encompassing phenomenon within scripture. The literary manifestation alone is pervasive. Even a cursory survey of the artful construction of simple sentences, a chapter, chapters, or entire books through parallel writing, finely crafted poetry and narratives is compelling. The very words and instructions spoken by God through his prophets are often expressed in poetry. Interpreters who want to read the text correctly would do well to determine the conventions that govern each literary practice. In fact, God expresses himself more as the consummate artist than systematic theologian. Many have written on the phenomenon, both Protestant and Catholic. For all this scripture has its own language, which is not that of metaphysics, but of poetry. In the images of the Bible, God takes as his media their linguistic equivalents, verbal icons, to communicate his gracious truth. This befits our nature and situation. It bestows dignity on the material realities in whose settings we live. The nature of God's revelation in either testament is regularly revealed through artistic manifestations instead of analytical treaties and logical discourse. Art and religion provide the patterns of meaning, the frames of perception by which society interprets its experiences and from which it makes conclusions about the nature of its world. They tell us what is. They do not respond to what. Our human need for transcendence, for meaning, for value can be met to a degree in, for example, a majestic symphony. Aesthetic needs are no different from needs for love, power, or food. 
Some people like to play music or read poetry, even when they're not compensated for their effort. We often forego the satisfaction of other needs so as to satisfy aesthetic needs. We suffer when we cannot pursue our aesthetic interest. So those are a few quotes from Dr. Joanne Davidson's article, Toward a Theology of Beauty. Trust me, she has plenty more in there that you'd want to dive into. Thanks so much again for listening in, and let us know what you thought about this week's podcast in the comments section below. Once again, we'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Joanne Davidson. Stay tuned for next week as we wrap up an amazing year of faith dialogues and look to the future for what we have in store next season. Thanks again to the Adventist Learning Community for making this program possible. If you have a question or comment about today's program, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at AdventNext. See you next week.